I would like to begin, first of all, by saying that uh, this speech tonight will be in a form of English. Although I, I have to simultaneously translate from my native language of Texan. <laughs> they use the term common sense. Did you get that today? Anybody observe this common sense? And uh, I think having any sense at all these days is not really that common, is it? <laughs> uh, seriously, the more, I, the more I look into the, some of the things that are going on, the more I'm wondering where is the sense behind any of it. Fifteen years ago, I was of the opinion that all the Muslims were basically hijackers and kidnappers, terrorists and... You know, basically they didn't believe in God, worshiping a black box out in the desert somewhere, kissing the ground five times a day. I never dreamed that I would meet a Muslim. And then when I did, I thought the best thing for this person was to convert him to Christianity. And if anybody would ever told me that I'd be hanging out with Muslims at all, I would have told them they needed uh, common sense. That that doesn't work. But then, it was an amazing challenge met me somewhere along the road. And that challenge was, uh, it, it came backwards actually to me. I didn't see it coming. Because the person said to me that he would come to my religion if my religion is better than his religion. I figured, hey... Christianity, you don't have to pray five times a day. You don't have to stand and worship God in a certain way. And you don't have to go in Mecca for something that's called pilgrimage. And you don't have to fast the month of Ramadan. And you don't have to pay something called zakah. And basically, you don't really have to do anything as far as a daily routine or anything like that. But then he hit me with a common sense question. He said, I will go to your religion if it's better than mine, but would you come to mine if it's better than yours? And all I could think about was, yes, but. Yes, but I'm sure that mine's better. He said, I'll come to your religion, though, if it's better. Then he said, but you'll need proof. And I was thinking, hold on a second. Religion is not about proof, it's about faith. He said, but in Islam we have both. And I'm saying, you mean you can prove there's God? He said, oh yeah, without doubt we can do that. We can offer proof. And I said, yeah, but scientific proof. He said, yeah. I said, no, testable proof, evidence that God exists. He said, Islam's been offering that for 1400 years. So, well, if that's the case, why are there still atheists out there? And that was a good common sense question, isn't it? Either they haven't been exposed to this evidence that he's talking about, or, or they're not using common sense. <laughs> One or the other. But I'll come back to what happened. I decided that if he had any kind of proof, I needed it myself. It certainly would help in the work that I was doing, preaching, etc. And that's when I began this exploration to try to better understand what it is that Muslims are talking about. And a phrase that's used by Muslims all the time, La ilaha Yeah, see, you know where I was going, didn't you? Muslims understand it pretty fast. I believe, and this is my contention, that the problem lies on the side of the Muslims. I feel like they really haven't done a job to get that message even instilled within themselves, much less try to convey it to somebody else. Is that pretty much true? I can't hear you. Don't forget you're going to be asked the same thing on the Day of Judgment. <laughs> same thing. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, that's what I thought. Sometimes the truth does hurt. Especially when somebody puts it right in your face. The common sense truth is, 
we as Muslims, I consider myself one now, haven't really done the job. That's why I'm happy to be here on the part of Voice of Islam. I think this is a great effort. It's interesting that the, some of the best efforts that I've seen in the Western world are by Muslims that are like myself, people who came to Islam, people who chose to spend the rest of their lives trying to apologize for the rest of the Muslims that didn't do the job. But I think that's being hard enough on the Muslims. I think it's now time to talk about what that message is and, and hope that I deliver it in a common sense way. The first thing to do though before you go into a subject like this is to be sure everybody is agreeing on the terms and understanding what's being meant by what's being said. That's why I always do a little bit of etymology, at least five minutes worth in any program that I do. Be sure you understood what I meant by what I said. Now, the first word I want to break down for you is the word Allah. I was on a television program here today in Christchurch with a woman by the name of Jo. Some of you probably know who she is. She was bringing up this subject of Allah. She's saying to her, it looks like Allah and God are, could be the same. And I said, no, it's not right. And she was surprised that I said that. And I said, not that your understanding of the, of the word, but the word itself. The word God doesn't equal the word Allah. The reason for that is because you don't have a word in English for Allah. You're, if you're using English, and trying to talk about the God of Abraham and the God of Adam and the God of Jesus, peace and blessing be upon them, you don't have the same word that these mighty prophets had because they had the Semitic languages, Hebrew and Aramaic and Arabic all have a word that they can use for a proper noun for the one and only God. But you know that, the, that that was a fact. Yeah. But I'll help you to give evidence. It's because anytime you're going to talk about common sense, you've got to have evidence or proof of what you said. It has to be something you can at least test to see if there's some reality to it. So, and we found this to be true right here in Christ Church. And that's in the hotel or motel where we're at. We pull the drawer out beside the bed, reach in and take out the what? Everybody knows that, don't they? You just know that. There wasn't any second thought. We weren't talking about a map of the area. There's a Bible in there, placed by the Gideon Society. And when you open it up, you turn five pages. And you look, and it tells you the languages that they've translated the Bible into. First of them is the Afrikaans language, and then the second one says Arabia, Arabic. The verse that's being translated is John 3.16. And now who doesn't know what's John 3.16? Anybody doesn't know? Almost everybody in the room, even the Muslims, know what it is. For God so loved the world, now you know the rest of it. Okay. Look at it in Arabic, if you can read Arabic, and it says, real clear, Allah. Allah. Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha. Right there. So, that verse for Christians is very clear to use this word Allah. But the word for God, the word for a God is Ilah in Arabic. Whenever something is worshipped, whether it be a rock, a stick, a stone, a bone, or any object of affection, that is sacrificed to, supplicated to, or asked from, or giving thanks to, all of these things, God, like you could use it, the little, the little letter G, G-O-D. But when you use a capital G-O-D, you're still using the exact same word. There's no difference. And he said, yeah, but it's capitalized. All right, I'm going to ask you a question. If you're talking to somebody, how can they tell it's capitalized? Are you going to jump up every time you say, God was the... And 
If you start a sentence, you have no option. You have to start it with the capital letter G. And the reason isn't that there's anything wrong with your thinking. There's nothing wrong with the concept of God. The problem is English doesn't have the word. Never did have. So you're just substituting a word you already have and capitalizing it. The word used in the Arabic for Jews on the first page of Genesis is a law in the Arabic language. And there are Arab Jews. And it's spelled Alif Lam Lam Ha. Allah. Seventeen times on page one in their Bible, in their book. Same book that they attribute to Moses. The first five books are attributed to Moses. So now that we got that established, it means whenever you hear a law, you're talking about the word used in the Arabic. The word used in Aramaic, that's the language of Jesus, is almost identical, Allah. And if you say, well, I don't hear any difference. Well, I'm pronouncing a silent H on one of them and not on the other. Allah and Allah. Essentially, again, it's the same word. So I got that out of the way. Next word is Islam. When I'm talking about Islam, what am I talking about? Most people consider Islam to be the proper noun representing the religion of, more, of all Muslims going back to Muhammad, peace be upon him. But in fact, the reference used within the Quran itself and even in the Bible, you might be surprised, is talking about the verb form from Aslama. And this is to surrender, submit, Obey in sincerity and in peace, Almighty God, Allah. This indicates immediately two entities, one who's submitting and one who's being submitted to. One who is surrendering and the one that they're surrendering their choice to. Allowing Allah's will to dominate in their life. If you're familiar with the Bible, there's a phrase used by Jesus, peace be upon him, in two of the Gospels, wherein he talks to them about a prayer, which we today call the Lord's Prayer. And it says in there real clear to, to invoke God by saying, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be praying that every day. And yet you'll find that there's no difference between this expression and the meaning of the word Islam. If you're asking for God's will, that's what Muslims are talking about when they say Islam. To do God's will instead of doing what you want to do. To give up these worldly desires, lusts, and chasing after, after the almighty dollar in favor of obeying the almighty. If you get that concept already, if that's in your mind, then you can understand the word Islam much better. I realize that we have the newspapers telling us how to think every day. We have journalists who are telling us how to use our brain or basically not use it. And this is really why we have drawn conclusions that we've come up with. And Muslims are no different than anybody else in this respect because there are journalists on both sides, whether from the West or the East, presenting these concepts, presenting these ideas in such a way that we have a tendency to believe that that's all there is to it. It's just that and nothing more. I want to show you something and then I think it'll help you to know better. You have a choice. You can consider your journalists and your editors to be either ignorant, in which case you shouldn't waste your money on their papers, or consider them to be devious, in which case you should work to get rid of these folks and replace them with somebody a little bit more honest. That's your two choices. Because when you see something that's real clear, and there's no doubt about it, but yet they're telling you something else, then what is the motive behind that? 
The example I'm going to give you right now, I want you to think about it. When they use terms like Muslim and then talk about in contrast to those who are the Islamics. Now, I've seen it to the extent that when I was down in Florida on a talk show, when we came off, and by the way, on the talk show, the questions that the host presented to me were not truly questions. They were statements, loaded statements, that didn't provide did not provide for any opportunity to give a straight answer. Let me give you an example of that. Somebody says to you, can you answer a question for me, yes or no? Our audience is listening today and we'd just like you to give a yes or no answer to a simple question. Okay. Is your mother out of jail yet? <laughs> My mother's never been in... No, no, no. Yes or no. Yes or no. Just real quick. But she's never been in... Yes or no. So you're not going to answer the question. I see. You thought, well, okay. She's out of jail. Well, glad she got out. <laughs> There's no way you can deal with a question like that. And this is exactly what this woman on this show was doing to me uh, some years ago in Florida. On the way out the door, and by the way, she had all of this stuff written down. She'd had a book which attacks Islam, and she had these questions that she took out of this book. Written by Steve Emerson. Now, by the way, he's from Oklahoma City, and he has his own reasons why he hates Muslims. And that's why he calls himself an expert on terrorism. But to hate something doesn't make you an expert on it. It really doesn't. When we were going out the door of the studio where we did the program, that radio show, the woman turned to me and said, Oh, when we were on the air, I forgot to ask you. I wanted to find out if you were one of the Muslims or one of the Islamics. <laughs> the Muslims are laughing because it's hysterical if you know Arabic. That's hysterical. There, first of all, there isn't really anything such as an islam ik. You're Latinizing the term Islam, that's all you're doing. Meaning that somebody who follows Islam. And some would actually have you believe that there's a difference between somebody following Islam and then one of those Muslims. But if you know just the beginning of the Arabic language, you'd know how big of a lie that really is. Because in English, we would add ER after a verb to show you the one who performs the verb. Yes or no? Yeah, okay. Let's do some examples though. Walk, walker. Talk, talker, think. Thinker, stink, stinker, well, it's like that. <laughs> but in Arabic, it, they don't, it's not structured the same way. It's like Hebrew, it's not structured like that. You have a prefix of the letter meme, which is pronounced mu, like this, mu. So if somebody adans, they give the adan, they're called a mu'adam, not an adoner. It's funny, isn't it? When you hear it, somebody makes English with everybody. So, another one is, if somebody is traveling. In Arabic, the word is safar. And our word safari comes from the Arabic word safar. But if you said it in English, this man is a sufferer. By the way, sometimes when I travel, I do suffer, but this is another story. But it, it, this sounds funny. He's a musafir. If he's speaking, he's mutakalam. If he's praying, he's musalli. And you, you, you don't catch that until you know this, this rule. So if anybody Islams, they're not an Islamic. They're a Muslim. Mu-Islam. So it's like somebody asking you, you know, are you a human or are you a homo sapien? <laughs> and they're saying it with a straight face. And it's like, duh! You don't get common sense out of those kind of questions. So there's the problem. Got one more word for you to think about and then I'll go to the topic exactly. Inshallah. The word is Quran. Now even the Muslims mess up on this one when they try to translate it. And it's not really the fault of anybody. It's just one of those things. The English language changes and on a regular basis. 
but sometimes radically. Sometimes to the extent that within two or three hundred years a word has lost its meaning and became some other meaning. And in some cases, even in 50 years, a word is totally the opposite of what it used to be. For instance, uh, the word gay. Do I need to explain anything? You already understood. Didn't you? What did I mean? If you look to the dictionary 50 years ago, it was very clear that someone was happy, jovial, very, very pleased he is gay. Huh? And if you coupled that with a phrase that used to be used uh, differently. Somebody's looking for something, you know, and they're digging around for it in the house and go off here into the hall closet and look, ah, I found it, so I'm very happy. So he says, uh, I just came out of the closet and I'm gay. <laughs> what kind of a, how, you know, stop and think what he just said. So I'm just talking about language itself. And the word, for, and I'm going to use the Bible for the benefit of those that are Christian, and you probably realize this real quick. Where in the Bible does it say to beat children, to make them come to Jesus? Does it say that? To beat on the children and make them come to Jesus? How many know what I'm talking about? Anybody? Suffer the children to come unto me such as the kingdom of heaven. Suffer, S-U-F-F-E-R, is used right there. But is that what it meant? Not the way we understand the word suffer today, is it? Again, it's because of the language change. Now, if you get the Revised Standard Version of the Bible in the preface to it, it explains that word or many other words that just don't fit any longer and that's why they had to call for a change to, to the translation a retranslation of the King James Version was done in 1952, I believe, and that was one of the key reasons because the words just don't mean the same thing. That and the fact they found a lot of other older manuscripts and were better prepared to offer renderings to meanings. So this word Quran has been misunderstood even by Muslims and they call it the Holy Book of Islam. In fact, if I would have started out by saying Holy Book of Islam, I think everybody here would have just assumed I was talking about the Quran, right? But Holy Book in Arabic is Kitabu Maqdis. Yes? And what book now am I talking about? That's the Bible. Yes or no? That's exactly what Arab Christians call the Bible. Kitabu Maqdis. So, the, the problem comes in off of an English translation over a hundred years ago using the word for standing and uh, doing uh, poetry or recitation from memory. They used to call it a reading. And a person would stand and read. Just as you might expect uh, someone to do the, the light brigade or recite the constitution or any kind of reading. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. That's a reading. So somebody would say read. So, first word coming in the Quran is Iqra, which means what? I just got through explaining to you, it wasn't that, and you said it anyway, didn't you? Just got through telling you that, and you said it anyway. Because of what? Because you have had it repetitiously presented to you over and over and over and over, and it was an order, read as the imperative of this verb. You read. That's the way it's offered in Arabic. To whom? Who was being ordered to read? Muhammad. Did he know how to read? And who's ordering him to read? The angel. Gabriel, sent by Allah. Now you're going to tell me Allah didn't know that Muhammad didn't know how to read, huh? I thought we were going to talk about common sense. Iqra. Is that what he said? 
Ekara bismi rabbi kaladi halak halakal insan min alak. Ekara wal rubukal akram. Allah di alamu bil kalam alam al insan alam yalam. They say ikra or not. And you're translating that as what? Re recite. He was saying in reply, La ana bikari. I'm not a reciter. That's what he said. Read the hadith. He also said, Ana ummi, which is illiterate. But for sure you have to understand the word Qur'an is the recitation, is the actual recitation that Muhammad peace be upon him heard from the angel. Then he recited it, his companions recited it, and they passed it on in oral tradition, mouth to ear, over the many centuries. Our visitors, our guests here tonight do not know that. Many of you learned it when you were little, you just accepted it, but in translation you're given a total wrong picture about this. You make it sound like he's sitting there reading and writing and he came up with this whole thing sitting in a cave somewhere and went, let's see, let's make up a religion today. Oh, uh, let me begin by, um, women have to get all covered up. Nah, let me start with, uh, hmm, that's not how it did. It, it didn't come this way. How it came was, the angel, Gabriel, Jibril in Hebrew and in Arabic, he's called Jibril. He comes to Muhammad, peace be upon him, over a period of 23 years with little bits and pieces until the very end. And at the very end of the whole thing, in the month of Ramadan, the angel recites the entire Quran cover to cover to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then he in turn repeats it in front of the people. So they can hear it, because obviously they're not hearing the angel. Now, the significance gets real critical when you understand that in later years, one of the companions of Muhammad became the leader of the Muslims and ordered this to be put down, sort of like the official rubber stamp from the government kind of a thing. This is how it's to be done. People today, not knowing Arabic and not knowing the story, have a tendency to think that it's actually something that came up 30 years after Muhammad and they wrote it down. And some people even stretched it further than that and said it was 200 years later and this kind of thing. And that's not the way it was. In fact, it comes like this. That they brought reciters together who sat there and recited while somebody wrote down and they were just double checking to make sure they wrote the same thing that was being recited. Because the Quran is recited today just as it was recited 1400 years ago. Now, I would challenge anybody to consider this just for a minute. To go back, let us just go back six, seven hundred years to the time of Shakespeare. Anybody here ever read Shakespeare? Have you read it? Yeah. And now, those of you who have studied Shakespeare as a, as a topic, in university or anything like this. You might, you might already be aware of it, but there are some folks out there who don't know this. There are many versions of Shakespeare's work. Did you know that? Many. Because in fact, some of what comes out really wasn't from Shakespeare. It was some of those who had done these uh, plays, uh, thespians who had later written down some things and they had shared this with others and did different forms of the same plays. That's why there are different versions. You might be surprised to, to realize that the same is true of Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey. That in fact they do attribute those works to his students, not really to him. How many of you have heard that before? Yeah, we do have some students of the language here. Okay. Now, the Quran is not like that. There are not any versions of the Qur'an except when you do translations of the language and we don't consider that to be the Qur'an anymore. As soon as you say the Qur'an in English has mistakes, we're going to go, there's no such thing as Qur'an in English. What there is is people's interpretation that they wrote down and that's not the Qur'an. So this is another mistake that Muslims have made and it's, it's understandable how you would do it because you're trying to tell people, look, here's the copy of the Qur'an. Would you like the Qur'an? You'd like to take it home and read it? Yeah, I sure would. Well, here you go. 
here, and it says glorious Quran right across the top, and you get home, open it up, it's all English. How could that be the Quran? It's impossible. Remember, I said it's recitation. Quran means the recitation. That's not it. That's a translation to another language. Quran is complete. All 6,327 verses or ayahs of the Quran are today the same as they were at the time they came to Muhammad. Nobody has taken anything out or added anything to since his death. Peace be upon him. That true, Muslims? That's the way you understood it? That's what, uh, this is what I understood. Now, I have visited many Muslim countries. Turkey, Egypt, Morocco, the Gulf countries like Arabia and Kuwait, UAE, Pakistan, India, which is a Hindu country but has a lot of Muslims over there. Then I visited a lot of non-Muslim countries as well. All through Europe, UK, just came off a long tour in UK, and Canada, and even Mexico, and believe it or not, even a place called Texas. <laughs> and every single place, including right here in New Zealand, I have met people who have memorized this book, this Quran, cover to cover, word by word, letter by letter in its entirety, from mouth to ear, mouth to ear. How many of you here in this room have actually met a person, know a person, or perhaps yourself, have totally memorized the entire Quran? Raise your hand. Well, there you go. And that's, this is New Zealand, right? This is not an Arab country, is it? Many people are shocked to find that out. This is a very important subject. Because today there are more than 10 million human beings living on this earth who have totally memorized this book, this Quran, this recitation. And over 88% of them are not Arabs. Non-Arab speakers, yet they memorize it in Arabic language. Check this out. One and a half billion people on the earth today have memorized at least portions of the Quran exactly in the Arabic language, even if it's Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, and so on. How many of them here have memorized that surah? There you are. And is there going to be any difference if I recite it right now? In the way you learned it, wherever you learned it, whatever country you learned it in, even here, wherever, is there going to be a difference? Better not be. You're going to have a bunch of Muslims up on the stage dragging me out of here. I mean, it's really a, a serious subject when you talk about the Quran to a Muslim. This is not just some version that some king came up with, or it's not some version that some group came up with, or little group of churches said, why don't we do our own translation, or Jimmy Swaggart's good news for modern man. It's not like that. In fact, it's the only book on earth that if we lost all the books on earth, we could bring it back exactly word for word, dot for dot, jot for jot, tittle for tittle. I think some of you know where I'm pulling that from. Straight out of Matthew 5.17 that not a jot or dot or tittle will be in any wise lessened talking about the commandments of the Old Testament. And that's what Jesus said. So, in any case, I think I made my point about the Quran. The recitation, it's God's recitation to human beings. And it does have phrases clearly addressing all human beings. And it's not fair. It is not fair that Muslims have kept this silent from the Western people. It isn't fair. Because if somebody entrusts you with a message to deliver to the people, and you don't deliver that message, then you are not, uh, you are not trustworthy. You have not lived up uh, to your responsibilities. It is a fiduciary within Islam that Muslims must convey this message. Even if it's a single verse from the Quran, they have the obligation to do it. And as long as Muslims did this, they were successful. For over a thousand years, Islam reigned very successfully. The education, the science, the medicine, 
Many of the things we take advantage today find their roots in the scientific disciplines within the Islamic empire. Going all the way back to Islamic Spain, to Egypt, Morocco, some of the oldest universities on this earth still in existence today and we don't even know about that. Here in the West we just, we just don't know. There's no clue. Yet there's a verse. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya yul insan attaqarabakum Allah de khalaqakum min nafsin wahidin wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa bitha rijalan kathirin wa nisa. Now I'll stop there because the next one it talks to the believers as well. To talk a lot. But it says, O oh mankind. Address to mankind. How could you as Muslims not tell mankind this message? How? And wonder why you're having so much trouble in the world today. Don't you believe that it's Allah that's giving you the problems? Huh? And why? Because you haven't done what you're supposed to do. You don't have to convert anybody. In fact, you can't. Allah doesn't even want you to do that. La ifrah hafadeen. But He did ask you to deliver a message and you didn't do it. These people don't know that. Let me translate it the best I can. Not much in translation, but I'll give it a shot. O mankind, fear your guardian Lord who created all of you from a single person, Adam, and from him brought forth his mate. And from these two brought forth many, many peoples, men and women. And in the same recitation, the Quran, chapter 49, Surah Al Hujrat, Allah says again that He's the one who created all of us from a single, and from the single brought forth His mate. And from these two, talking about Adam and Eve, He brought forth many tribes and nations and made you different from each other. Why? Who in this room, not Muslim, knows why God created us different in these tribes? And you don't know that unless you know what Allah said in the Quran. He said, so you'll recognize each other. Not that you'll have an one-upmanship over somebody else because you're white and they're black, or you're brown and they're yellow, or you're tall and they're short. But because... Allah, Almighty God, deemed it to be that way. But never that there would be any of this racism. Something very hated to Allah to the extent it's called Asabiyya. It is so hated to Allah because it's a form of oppression. And Allah hates oppression and He hates when people oppress. And those who are oppressors are called wrongdoers in Arabic. Volimin and Vulm. Is so hated to Allah. And a lot, by the way, a lot of wrongdoing of this nature we do to ourselves. La ilaha illa anti subhanaka in kuntum There are many stories from the Quran that give us ways to deal with the problems we have today. But even the Muslims are not reading their own book and not applying it. Instead, they're listening to some knothead telling them that Islam says this and Islam says that. Some even are listening to non Muslim sources telling them, your religion says you should go out and kill so many people and you'll go to paradise and have 70 dancing virgins or stuff like this. What the heck is this? Show me the page in the Quran where it says this. This is nonsense. And certainly the Western media is having a heyday with that kind of stuff. They want to scare people. That's a, that's a, I don't know what kind of fun they get out of that, but if you imagine that there's a billion and a half people out there that are Staying up all night long, coming up with diabolical plots, how to terminate the whole world, and it's just like... And nothing could be further from the truth. You've got a couple of folks out of several thousand who have bizarre ideas. No doubt about that. But that doesn't represent the rest of them, does it? It's the exception, isn't it? It's not the rule. But again, the Muslims are not making this clear to the general public. They're not. What's happening is, there are Muslims who are standing up and saying the truth, but there's no vehicle to get the message out. Since, for instance, September the 11th, 2001, we've had so many of the scholars of Islam immediately releasing statements, sending faxes, 
and putting up websites totally condemning this action, totally uh, with the victims, saying that this is not anything to do with Islam, and whoever did this, these people have nothing to do with Islam. Uh, so many people have done that. Is that true or false? They, they have been doing it and doing it. But yet the common folk in the non-Muslim world don't know that. Muslims are blaming the media. And in this particular instance, it's not the media's fault. It really isn't. You know why? It's not their obligation to go and search for that kind of information, especially in Muslim countries, and publish that when they have their own folks that have other stories for them to publish. It's the responsibility of the Muslims to take a little bit out of that money that you're chasing after so hard every day and invest that so that folks can know and understand what's really going on. And by the way, that's one of the great things about Voice of Islam because they're doing exactly that. In Singapore, there's another group over there, the Muslim reverts over there are converts to Islam. They're doing essentially the same thing. They're working and spending their hours and time, money, resources, trying their best. And it's working because the government at least recognizes and says, okay, these guys, they're saying something that makes sense. They're working, trying to make ways for people to, to live together, and especially for our youth in the future. Regardless of what you think about me, and, and it really isn't important if you stop and think about it, because I'm going to be gone tomorrow. I'll be somewhere else, inshallah. But regardless what your concept of me or any of the Muslims are today, Think about the future of your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Don't you want them to have a better life than what we have? We always say we want them to have a better life, but does that just mean money? Does it just mean I want them to have a bigger house, a bigger car? Is that what we meant? Because if it is, then we're wasting our time anyway. Because you can't control that. That's not in your hands to control. But for sure... It is in your hands to control the environment, what they're going to have tomorrow to grow up in. And I'm really being hard on the Muslims on this one because even our own youth are very confused because they don't have a real contact with the true Islam. As long as we have people out here who are distorting this picture and we have people out here that are maligning the picture, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, and we have people that are actually take him away into something totally different, then you're going to keep having problems. And it's not fair. It's not fair to our children. It's not fair to the other people's children. It's not fair to the future of mankind to continue in this way. And until the Muslims wake up to this fact, it's not going to change. That's a real common sense statement. Yes or no? Who disagrees with that? Anybody? And by the way, don't forget I'm from Texas. <laughs> you're either with us or you're with... No, no, that's a different speech. <laughs> I, I can't believe we've been elected as governor. But anyhow, I didn't vote for him, by the way. The common sense message of Islam, and then I'm done. This is it. Here you go. La ilaha illallah. La in Arabic means no. N-O. It negates. Totally and absolutely denies. This is a heavy word. L-A-A -A in English or la malif in Arabic. You want to know what's la? True or false? You're being awful quiet today. La ilaha? Yeah, I know you know it. That's the message. There isn't any God worthy to be worshipped. Oh, there are gods out there. <laughs> People worshipping these idols, worshipping good luck charms, worshipping their, their amulets they carry around for good luck and... People that are looking to their horoscopes and wondering what the stars have in for them today, going to their medium to read their hand. <laughs> That's a funny one, isn't it? You want your hand red? How many of you remember that joke? You want your hand red? You hold it out, they paint it red. <laughs> but anyhow. <laughs> P 
People worship money. Yes or no? There's even one country that on the money itself, you guys are playing around with your coins, right? <laughs> you doing that? Changing your coins out, yeah? Well, there is a country, and I've seen their bills, and it says right on the bill that that's their God. It says right on it, in God we trust. All others pay cash. The message the Muslims are supposed to be giving to the people is clear. That we worship the one only God that created the heavens and earth, the universe, in six days. That's what it says in the Quran. Thuma astawa ala arsh. And then rose up above his throne. It's the same God that created human beings from Adam and Eve. It's the same God that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and parted the water so that they could go across the Red Sea. The same God that drowned Pharaoh. The story is in the Quran. It's the same God that reinforced Suleiman, Solomon. The same God that created from a woman a baby. And this baby spoke from the cradle. This baby actually fulfilled prophecy. And it says in Quran that he was the Messiah. And Messiah is from the Hebrew Mes and the Arabic Mes. That's what it says in the Quran. And if you translate it to Kone Greek, that's where you get the word Christos, from which we derive the word Christ, for which the city that we're in right now is named. It's nothing but a translation and an interpolation of the word Christos, which is translated from Messiah. Messiah. And by the way, if you want to know what it really means, it means anointed. Because this is the verb. This is a demonstration of the verb right here. See what I'm doing? This is wiping. Anointing, because they used to use anointing oil made from olive oil, zaytun, put their fingers in that oil, and then when they had a king for Israel, they would anoint his forehead. And that was the ceremony, and that's what is being referred to in the Old Testament, that he will come, the anointed one, the Messiah, will come. And that's exa exactly who the son of Mary really was. He was that Messiah. And he did come and he did miracles. And it's not over yet. Quran tells us real clear. He's not dead. If you think Jesus is dead, you don't understand Islam. Muslims know full well he's alive, he's with God, and he will be back in the last day. There are prophecies from Muhammad making it clear that eventually, before all things come to pass, before the end, that in fact, Muslims and Nasrani will join together to fight a common enemy. Who are the Nasrani? Anybody knows what that means? Christians. That's good news. That's really good news. I'm happy to hear it. Having been both, having understood both sides, I like this idea. It's a great concept. He did not predict that we would be attacking the Christians and Christians attacking us and blowing up the buildings. And it was, it's not, He said we would fight together against a common enemy. There's more on the subject, but this is enough to give you an idea that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is showing us something good. Something really good. As regards those who will ask the questions about salvation in Islam, because now you get curious, well, what does Islam say about salvation? For a Christian, you pretty much have to have Jesus on a cross or you don't have any salvation. That's pretty much what Paul is saying. Paul is telling you that real clear. Without Jesus on a cross, basically, we don't have anything. <coughs> Muslims are saying that you have to have the correct belief that there really is only one God. You have to follow the commandments. 
that if you don't follow those commandments, you're not really demonstrating any belief in God to start with, especially if you break the first commandment. This is blasphemy to worship other gods beside God. Muslims are also saying that you have to have faith and works together. You have to have faith and works. Because faith without works is dead. Does the Bible say that? Read the book of James. It's exactly what it says. At the same time, Muslims believe that your amalek, your actions and your deeds, will not save you. Your actions are not going to save you. In fact, your actions are nothing in front of God. <laughs> they will not save you. Those actions are not going to do it. You have to have the correct belief to go with it. And even with the correct belief, and even with a mountain of good deeds, a person still cannot enter paradise without Rahmah, the mercy of Allah. Two examples, and then I'll leave the subject. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that there would be a man that would be brought on the day of judgment. He never had any bad deeds, but he had a mountain of good deeds. And he'd be asked, the angels would ask him, would you like to enter paradise based on your deeds? And he said, I don't have any bad ones. All I got good, sure, I'll, I'm going to enter on my good deeds. They said, or the mercy of God. He said, no, nah, just let me enter on my good deeds. Then they would bring al-mizan, which means a scale or a balance, and take God's mercy, God's mercy that he gave you just for one of your eyes, and the weight of that to be set on one side would totally offset all the weight of his mountain of good deeds. That's how much mercy that Allah has given. That's just for one eye. What about the other one? The fact that, and, and do this sometime, just hold your hand over your eye and look around. You lose depth perception real fast like that. How about, what's the mercy to be able to see depth? Amazing, isn't it? And then another example, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, turned to his companions after one of the prayers and he said, nobody's going to enter paradise except by the grace of Almighty God. Illa except by the Rahmah of Allah. You have to have the grace. They said, even you? He said, even me. So, your deeds won't cut it either. Does the Bible say that? Yeah, it says right in the Bible. That before the Lord, your good works are filthy rags. The only way you're going to get to paradise is by the grace. The salvation comes from God, and that mercy and that grace comes to the one who believed correctly, did the good deeds, and then hoped for God's salvation. That's what it says. And by the way, just in case you thought that you don't have to follow the commandments anymore if you're a Christian, and I'm sure you know you do have to, but just in case you forgot, it's in Matthew 5.17, and that's where they said that Jesus said, Think not. Don't think that I came to destroy the law, means the Ten Commandments. Actually, it means all the commandments. The law is the Torah of the Old Testament. That was the word used, actually. I did not come to destroy the Torah, the law, but rather to fulfill it, and not until all things are passed, everything's accomplished, shall a single dot jot iota be in any ways lessened. And whoever breaks the least commandment and teaches this, he'll be the least in the next life. But whoever keeps the commandments and teaches that, he'll be the highest in the next life. And unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will never enter paradise. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the time, and Jesus is saying they're going to hell. Salvation in Islam, watch this. I was talking with the, the lady on the TV show today about this subject. She asked me about hell to describe it. She says it sounds so real. I said, it's real to us. <laughs> we know that there are levels in hell and it gets worse and worse as you go lower and lower and it's so horrible that even the rocks, there are rocks in the hell that are fire, the making the fire from these rocks, even these rocks are afraid of the worst place. And I asked her, do you know who's in the worst place in the hell? Allah says he's going to start the fire of hell with a certain group of people. How many of you know that it's going to actually be from the Muslims that are going to be there? Yeah, that's true. Yes, sir. Believe it or not, the worst part of hell is going to have Muslims in it. That's a teaching. That's not something that make you want to join up with, is it? 
But that's what it says. They will be the people who preached the message but didn't follow it. The scholars, the teachers, the mufti, the imam, the one that stands up in front of everybody, he tells them what's Islam, but he doesn't follow it himself. And another example he gave will be running around trying to collect their bowels and pull them back in because the well, uh, how horrible it is. And the people say, well, you know, you're the one who told everybody about Islam. You were saying this and that. He said, yeah, but I didn't follow it. Islam doesn't promise you salvation by a magic saying. You say, la ilaha illallah, and you're saved. That is not the salvation. Unless there's belief in it. Commitment to it. If you really believe there's only one God, you want to worship Him, and you're trying your best, you may be a Muslim already and didn't know it. You may be. I don't know. But that's not up to Muslims to judge. All judgment comes with, alay salahu biakham al hakimin. There is no better judge than Allah. So I covered one of the areas that most people ask me about in the question and answer series. Another thing people will ask you, ask me, how did you go to Islam? And I tell you the same thing that I've heard many Muslims say who also did what I did. They say, God guided me. What can I tell you? It sure wasn't my intent. I was trying to convert somebody to Christianity, remember? How did I wind up here? I don't know. Why am I standing here in Christ Church in New Zealand talking about this? I don't know. This is what God guided me to do. People will also ask, well, do you think you're saved? Muslims don't think it like it that way. That Hey, I just said the magic word. I'm good to go, baby. Doesn't matter what I did. I'm forgiven. We don't have that. That is not our attitude. If you thought that was our attitude, it isn't. And really, I don't think that anybody that's responsible in their religion would think that anyway. I don't think any religion is teaching something like that. Oh, you get a few evangelist types who go out and say a lot of crazy stuff. We even have a few of our own idiots out here saying things, but we know who they are. For us, as Muslims, we constantly ask God's mercy we're constantly turning to Him for forgiveness. And I think all of us Muslims need to do that right now to ask God to forgive us for not doing a better job in conveying the message to the people. Because it's becoming so clear, it's crystal clear to me anyway, that one of the biggest problems Muslims suffer from around the world is Allah's not happy with us. He's not happy with us at all because we have not done the job we were entrusted with. A simple job. A real easy thing, convey. Iqra. Just recite it. If the people don't want it, that's fine. You did your job. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said something amazing. He said the last day is not going to come until Islam has entered every house on this earth, whether it's made from the fur of animals or out of the stones and rocks. Doesn't mean they'll all be Muslim, but it will get there. The message will get there. It's amazing, isn't it? You want to know what's amazing? You don't know what I'm talking about, do you? You want to know what's amazing? That has happened already. But it wasn't Muslims that put it in every house, was it? It was CNN, Fox Network, huh? <laughs> Wasn't it? Who put the message out there? Islam is. The only thing you've got left now, Muslims, is to straighten out people's perception. And let's start with ourselves. What do you think? Can we do that? But start with yourself. And let's, we can overcome a stigma real easy. Just let people see the real life of a true Muslim, and then they'll have no doubt. But as long as you continue to leave people in the dark, it'll always be the same or worse. So let's work together. Hmm? Inshallah? Let's share Islam. In case you didn't know it, the commercial's coming up here. I'm from the West. We know how to do that. Shareislam.com. S-H-A-R-E-I-S-L-A-M.com. Use our website. It's free. It won't cost you any money. You feel better now? Yeah, I know you would. Go there. You'll have our videos, our audios. The text files are there. Search for Islam. Is there all the links to all of our other websites? We have more than 2,000 websites on the Internet for these purposes. Make use of them. And email others and let them know the same thing.
and contribute. If you have something to say, say it. Send it to us so we can post it on the IslamNewsroom.com. Just go to Share Islam. You'll find all the links are there. But my brothers and sisters in Islam, if you don't do something about it, there won't be any common sense left. People will just continue to do this. And it's your generation that's responsible right now for what's going on. Forget about what happened in Turkey in 1922. Forget about it. It's, it's history. Forget about what happened back in the days of the fitna between the Shiite thing and Ali and Maui. Forget about that. That's not getting us anywhere today. Look to the one thing that's the most important of all. I'm going to quote to you from Sahih Bukhari, what the Prophet, peace be upon him, said. Whoever says, La ilaha illallah, whoever says there's no God to worship except Allah, and Muhammad's his messenger, and establishes the prayer and pays the zakat, is a Muslim. That's what it says. Now, after that, it's up to them to disprove what they said. But as long as that's where we stay, then we'll be all right. Let's work together on that subject. And now for our general audience, for the rest of you, so you can better understand what I'm saying. I'm asking the Muslims to take responsibility for something. And to do a good job to make clear to all their Muslim neighbors, uh, their non-Muslim neighbors, and open up, open up the mosques and open up their houses and, and whatever, to do what we did here tonight so we can sit together. Now, of course, I'm doing all the talking. You don't have a chance to ask questions. You don't have a chance to give any feedback. But when you're with your friends, the Muslim friends, you'll have a chance to ask questions, sit with them. I know ladies like to ask the women a lot of questions. I want to know why you guys got to dress like this. The funny part about it is <laughs> all women cover. All women cover according to what they consider needs to be covered. Well, the difference is the Muslim women are following what Allah has ordered them to cover. What's the difference? And it's not unlike the pictures that you see of the women of the time of Jesus, or Solomon, or David, or Abraham. You see the pictures, this is how they're dressed. Even when you see a nun today walking down the street, even if you're not Catholic, you see her, you say, hello sister, how are you today? You know, and it's, you don't say, why are you dressed like that? <laughs> Doesn't come in your mind, does it? It's perceptive. The perception that we have is largely based on the environment we grew up in. Prophet Muhammad said an amazing thing. He said that every single child is already born in the perfect state of a relationship with Almighty God. They're already in surrender, submission, obedience, <laughs> sincerity, and peace with God. Every baby is in that state. How many of you have used this innocent as a newborn baby? You've used that, haven't you? Yeah, you know what the expression is, yes? Only he said it with one word. Everything I just said, he said it in one word. Islam. Islam. Every baby is born in Islam. On the natural inclination or fitra, there's a word in Arabic. He said they're all born on the fitra of Islam. But it's their parents that will raise them up to become any other religion. He also made it clear that if any baby dies, they go to paradise, regardless of the religion or lack of it of the parents. He also made it clear that if anybody from the time of Adam until the last days, if they want to submit to God in that state of being in that baby-like beautiful relationship, surrendering to God, they also would die in the same way. It's up to God to judge, but certainly that's the condition of true Islam. So now I'll ask you the question. Based on the interpretation that I gave to the Arabic word Islam, doesn't it make common sense? Something for you to think about. And I'll close with a little prayer. And if you don't like it, don't say amen. And if you do like it, you can say amen up to you. But it's my prayer and I'm praying for the Muslims to be guided by Allah. And I'm praying for the non-Muslims to be guided by whatever name they give God. I'm not asking them to even change anything. But by whoever you think God's name is, for him to do the same thing. To give guidance to truth. To guide us to the straight path. To guide us in a way that we can live together in peace. Amen.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله One of the things about Islam, Islam is very inclusive. To the extent that there is hardly anything you're going to think of that Islam has not covered. You want to know anything about the life of the human being from the time they're born to the time they die, from the time that they wake up to the time they go to bed, every aspect of the life is covered, including sitting in Christ church on a stage trying to answer questions. That's covered in Islam. Because in Islam... It's a, it's a directive to all of us that when you don't know the answer, you must say, I don't know. You are not allowed to guess. I don't know is considered a correct answer. Now, now in the Islamic universities, they won't accept that. <laughs> But Allah will accept that, that you don't know, and that is a correct answer. So, uh, the other thing is, if you lie... This is worse than you can possibly imagine for a person to knowingly fabricate, prevaricate, or misrepresent the truth, or even leave it out intentionally to give you the wrong idea. Allah says in the Quran, Ya you ladina amanu wa kulu kaulin sadida. O you who believe, fear Allah and always speak the truth. Additionally, He tells us also in the Quran, That if you're a believer, you have to say the truth even if it's against yourself. We do not have in Islam this right to remain silent business like we do in the United States. If you are guilty and you're brought forth in an Islamic court, then you should admit your guilt. Because God knows you're guilty anyway. And lying to the people won't gain you anything at all with the law. It's not a concept that we're real familiar with in the West. But it is the Islamic concept. So, having stated that, I'll endeavor to try to tell the truth as much as I know, and what I don't know, I'm going to have to say, I don't know. But what we can do is try to find an answer for your question, and that's how you can uh, stay in touch with us through our websites and through our email, askislam at aol.com. The first question that's presented here is a question that says, is John 3.16 a lie? John 3.16 is in the English translation what Allah told us about the Bible that the original Bible came from Almighty God. The original words were also recited to previous prophets and each of them had things that were for their particular time and their peoples. But the last revelation came for all people in all times and all places. That would be the only differences. But God never was a man, and God never was the Son of Man. How many people disagree with what I just said? I wasn't quoting from Islam, I was quoting from the Bible, the book of Numbers. It says real clear in chapter 23, verse 19, God is not a man, that he should sin. Or error. It depends. There's different translations use a different verb. But it says God is not a man. And it continues and said, and he's not the son of man. And that's what I had reference to. So, in any case, the point is, within the Bible itself, you're going to find some very interesting comparisons. If you consider them to be contradictions, then that's up to you. But I'm not going to give you a hard time about your Bible. I will tell you that the Quran says that if this were from other than Allah, you would find within it many contradictions. There's a challenge for you right there. But before you try to contradict something, be sure you're reading it in Arabic. Because it's real easy to show you contradictions. I'm always going over these translations and finding many things that are problematic. Very much. I'll ask the Muslims, do you have any Arabs with us that know the Arabic language? Raise your hand. You know the Arabic. Classical Arabic. You ready? Give me one word in English for Dean. No. 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 No.
Can't do it. One word? No, there's no word. Daraba. Wadribuhuna. You know you don't want to try to translate that one. Another question came from the same person. They asked, can you elaborate on how Allah can be both just and merciful? Or all merciful. And what they meant by just was the word justice. Okay, not as in lacking anything. Because then you might say, well, that's just this. But it's not the meaning. To be just, absolutely fair. Allah has both names. He has 99 characteristics mentioned in Islam. And one of them is Ar-Rahman. Which is the all-merciful or compassionate or most gracious. There are many ways that we try to... But it, none of these words really in English bring forth what Rahama really means. In fact, he doubles it up because he gives you another word similar from the same root, Rahim, Ar-Rahman or Rahim. And it's so, if you know the words, it's like, oh wow, it's fantastic. And, and I'm digressing a moment, but I want to share this with the Muslims to give them a little benefit too for those who don't know the Arabic. The rest of the verse that I stopped on from Surah An-Nisa continues by saying that fear your Lord by whom you demand your mutual rights and do not cut the ties of the womb. That's what it says. But in Arabic it says Arham. Arham. What is Arham? Huh? It's the womb, isn't it? The uterus. But uterus is so clinical, isn't it? But in Arabic... It's beautiful because it's saying that the place where you're conceived inside of your mother is called the place of mercy, the mercy seat. This is where you are conceived, this place of mercy within your mother. So you start out in God's mercy and His grace, exactly what it says. It's so beautiful when you know the Arabic. How can God be just and merciful at the same time? Well, He's totally fair. But look at how He's fair and see if you like it. You're a human. We're all human in this room, I guess, except for the jinn that I don't see. But in any case, this is what he's making clear to you. That if you do a bad deed, he is only going to record one bad deed for you. At the same time, if you do a good deed, he's recording 10 or 70 or 700, 7,000, or as much as he likes for you. And he considers that fair, do you? Who would like to throw that away and say, nah, nah, just give me one? Huh? And what he measures it is according to your intention, because it's very clear, in the ma'amalu bin niyat. This is a saying of Muhammad, peace be upon him, that every action is going to be regarded by the intention. Some people don't have much of an intention when they do something. It works out good, but they don't have much intention on it. Others tried really hard. They had a good intention, but it just didn't work out. But he's still going to regard their what? The action based on this intention. So that's how you can get higher and higher and higher. So if you do a bad deed, though, you're only going to get one. But if you do good deeds, it could be worth a lot to you, an awful lot. And also, he's merciful, so merciful, to the extent that if you really meant well, you're a believer, you tried, that could count for so much and wipe away so much sin. And if you say, well, I don't think that's fair, well, maybe you don't have as much sin as I do. <laughs> but for all of the Muslims, we like that idea. But he's fair in that he never oppresses. The fact that he's generous with somebody doesn't mean he's not fair. Because he's going to treat everybody fair in that he will give and give and give as much as he likes to those whom he deems worthy. But he never oppresses. And this is a, a good ex a way to explain it, I believe. That was a good question. That was somebody thinking that said that. I like that. It says, uh, if you do the fasting but you don't wear the scarf, is it acceptable? I think that's a Muslim asking this question. Uh, I want to ask you, it's rhetorical, so the sister that wrote it, don't, don't, uh, don't say anything, but just think about this. 
Is it acceptable that you do the Salat but you don't wear the hijab during the Salat? And I think you got your answer. That was the Muslim asking that one. They know what I meant. Next question. How could the earth have been created in six days? When the same rocks and fossils took billions of years to form. I read it in Arabic. Very clear. It says, Well, are the ayam. Ayam is the plural of yawm. And the word yawm is also Hebrew. How many of you heard of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement? That's Hebrew. Yom Kiyama is the Arabic, the Day of Standing. Literally, it means the Day of Standing or the Day of Resurrection. Muslims believe in resurrection. All it will be, everybody will be resurrected. The word Yom in the Semitic languages means day, similar to as, it, as it is in English. But you might think that the word day only means 24 hours. How many of you think the word day only means 24 hours? That's all it means. How many think that? You thought day meant 24 hours? Let me ask you a question. Do you speak English? Did you ever hear anybody say, back in my day, which day do you think they meant? <laughs> the day will come, or you're going to rule the day that... You see, when they say it like that, what do they mean? They mean a period of time, don't they? It's very clear the word day is also used as a period of time. This has been explained by the Hebrew scholars long, long ago, even before, even before Muhammad, peace be upon him, ever came on the scene. That word was well explained to mean what? Period of time. Could be anything. Because as it says in the Quran, and Christians know this as well, that a day with Almighty God could be whatever he says it is. It could be a thousand years. Yes? It's in the Quran. So uh, how long is a day? To you and I, we're saying 24 hours. But who told us to think like that? Huh? Well, I got news for you. Jesus, peace be upon him, never said a day is 24 hours. Because they didn't divide it up like that, did they? So, I don't know, and guess what? I don't care. <laughs> I really don't. It's here. I know those rocks are there. You say they took a long time. And somebody else said it's a day. Ah, still, it's still a rock. It still hurt you if you step on it or somebody hits you with it. So it doesn't really matter. But it's interesting because the person who's asking obviously is being challenged or challenging themselves maybe to try to better understand what does this all mean. And I do have a, a solution for you, I think, that will help you. And that's let us go to scientists. Let us go to people that hold PhDs in these subjects, especially now you're going to be talking about uh, the structure of the earth. So let's go to those who are familiar with that and ask them, how is the earth built? How is it formed? And then let us look to the Quran and see if there's agreement or disagreement with what we know today. And in fact, if you go to the books that are being used in academia right now on the subject, you're going to be very surprised to discover that 1,400 years ago, Allah described things in the Quran we just found out in the last couple of decades. For instance, the deep roots of the mountain range that are in Europe that reach down hundreds of miles into the ground are spelled out real clear in the beginning of Juzama when it says autad, the plural of tent pegs the stake that going down into the ground. And it says that these mountains have these deep roots just like that. They only found that out recently. And we want to talk about human beings. What about how we're created and how we started out. And it's spelled out in the Quran again in things that you can only know under a microscope. Nobody can tell you except that they've had a microscope or else divine revelation. 1400 years ago, the Quran described the moment of conception and what you look like at the moment the zygote attaches itself to the wall of the arham, the, the raham in there, which is the, the uterus. Describes it as alaq. Then it describes it as the shape of it going to the chewed lump, mudga. 
in shape and out of shape. All of the stages of the trimesters, by trimester, are mentioned in the Quran before we even knew what that was. You want to talk about the universe and how it's working and what things are going on that we're only finding out right now with the Hubble telescope? And you find it in the Quran. Check it out. Even to the extent that it tells you in the Quran that people are never going to go outside of Earth's atmosphere until they have a great and mighty power to do so. Illa be Sultan, chapter 55, verse 33. Look it up. You will, oh, you assembly of mankind and jinn, try to go outside of Earth's atmosphere. Go, try, but you will never do it, illa be Sultan, except by a great and mighty authority or power. And by the way, when they put those rocket ships into outer space, do you know what kind of power it takes to get them up there? What kind of power does it take to get your car to go up the hill? What kind of power does it take to go up a mountain? Now ask yourself, I got four wheel drive, I'm going to try to get up the top of a mountain and I'm paying for this gas, this fuel to get up there. It's, it's costing me, right? What is it now, $1.55 a liter? Is that what you're paying? That's, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Huh? It is when you consider that NASA doesn't even measure they're fueled by the gallons or the liters. They measure it by the ton. They talk to you in terms of how many hundreds of tons of fuel it takes to lift that rocket ship up there to put those satellites out there so that CNN and Fox Network can tell you what terrorist Muslims are. <laughs> and you pay for it. Question. We need Islamic banking in New Zealand. How can we establish it? My friend, you have just labeled one of the clear reasons why Western mentality does not want to hear about Islam. That's the truth. How many of you know Islamic banking does not permit usury or interest? Whoops! And the Bible says, neither a borrower nor a lender be. It doesn't mean don't lend people your coat or your clothes or your, your car or things like that. No, what it means is don't charge people for the use of money because that's what Jesus drove the people out of the temple for, doing that very thing, yes or no. The very thing that's so forbidden in Islam, Allah declares war. And he says, be on, be on alert from a war from your Lord and from the Prophet, peace be upon him, if you're going to deal in this anymore. Islamic banking means that you have to have a way that the banker invests along with you and then he makes a profit if you make a profit, but he makes a loss if you make a loss. And there are not too many bankers who want to do that, are there? Huh? No. And the answer that I have for you is, I have no clue. But by the way, there are a whole lot of other things we need to work on first. <laughs> and you don't really need to buy a house right now. We've got a lot of bigger problems to worry about. We got Muslims and non-Muslims around the world dying. Innocent people are dying. And you're worried about buying a house. Shame on you. It says, what exactly does it say in the Quran about the women's dress? Why does Allah order it? And can you translate this thing? That's probably a Muslim asking the question. First of all, let me tell you where it is. Then you go read it in Arabic yourself and see. Chapter 24, verse 31. Chapter 33, verse 59. They're both very clear on that subject. I want to write it down, I'll say it again. Surah An An Nur. But read chapter 24 with verse 30. Read verse 30 first because it tells the men about their obligation. Then the women and their obligation. Then also when you're reading chapter 33, which is Surah Al Hasab, uh, verse 59. It starts out, Ya you and Nabi, and Allah is saying, Oh my prophet, tell your wives, tell your daughters, and tell the believing women that whenever they go out, they need to draw their jilbab over themselves and read it for yourself. And if you want to know why did God order that for the women, the answer is in a question. Why did God create a tree in paradise and put fruit on it and then ask Adam and Eve not to eat it. When you understand the why behind that, you'll understand the why to every other question you'll come up with. Okay, this is a person who has asked me a question which proves that I did not completely define the word Allah 
as I should have when I was doing the etymology. I got off on my subject and I left out part of it, which I ordinarily do. And you are perfectly correct in, in bringing my attention to it. The word Allah and the word God have another uh, point where they become dissimilar. The word God, you can always put an S on it and it becomes God's. You can also put E-S-S, it becomes goddess, female. This cannot be done with the word Allah because it is at a perfected state. It does not have gender, nor can it be made plural. Immediately, a critic, especially if they know Arabic language, will say, No, wait a minute, I read the Quran and it said right there, many places God says, we, our, and us. Yes or no? Nahnu. Does Allah say Nahnu? Yeah, He says it. He said we. That's we in Arabic, yes or no? Yeah. And khalaq na. The na at the end of the word khalaq means we created, yes or no? Yeah. It's we is in there. Us is in there. And our is in there. Yet I just got through saying it can't be made plural. What does it mean? If you're not Arab, Ask yourself, what in the world does that mean? And this is, this is serious. This is not just a joke. I'm not just playing with words. It is serious. It means you have to understand something, huh? Because the same thing is true of the word Allahumma. Yes? Also plural. It's like the word in Hebrew, Elohim, which is also plural in the Old Testament. It clearly says God is one, Elohim, but that's plural. Even the New Testament says real clear, God is one. What is the greatest commandment? They're asking Jesus, Mark 12, 29. And he responds back and tells them, To know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. One. Very clear. How do you explain this reference to the plural usage? Well, it's the royal we. The royal hour, the royal us, that's all it is. Just like a king or a queen who makes any type of proclamation, we declare the following. They always start out with the word we and it means myself. Just like when you use the verb to be, you say this is, because it's one. This is, that is, he is, she is, because they're one. When it's a group, more than one, these are, those are, they are, except when you speak to someone direct. If I speak to you directly, I say you are my friend. And when I refer to myself, I say I am, I don't say I is, and I don't say you is either. Well, some parts of Brooklyn, but... <laughs> Seriously, that's all it is. It's reference to the royalness of Almighty God. Just as it is when it says He in the Quran or Him. It does not mean gender. It doesn't mean that God is anatomically comparing Himself to a man because God is way above and beyond anything like that. He is not male nor is He female. And He makes it real clear. And by the way, He also has no... Uh, as I said, no gender. There's also no genealogy. God has no descendancy. He doesn't come from some other gods and nor does he have other gods underneath him. He's God alone. The status of Jesus, you didn't ask me about that, but the status of Jesus in Islam is not that he is a God, not that he's the son of a God, not that he's one in a triangle, but rather that he is a very high, high, high positioned prophet. He is a miracle, without a doubt. He is created without a father and you don't, there's no other case in history in such a, with such a circumstance. However, have you ever considered, before you start to worship Jesus because of that, have you considered the creation of Eve? She had no mother. Well, you don't worship her. And Adam had no mother or father, but you don't worship him. Yet we say about them, peace be upon them, because they are very mighty and wonderful. And by the way, the Quran says that Mary is the best of the women he created. That's what Allah says. So, 
I kind of branched off on that because you asked me a good question. I thought I should jump onto some of those others. What's the difference between the Quran Majid and Quran Kareem? Majid, I think our word majestic probably comes from the word Majid because it's very similar in meaning. And Kareem means uh, glorious, very glorious or uh, kind of, I don't want to say generous because that's uh, Kareem also, but this is more like glorious. I think a Muslim probably asked that one, I don't know. Uh, next, how do we learn? Learn? How do we know? Oh, how did we know that Alam, that Muhammad did make up the something thing? Gabriel thing. Well, if he made it up, then you'd have to ask yourself a question that was answered by his wife immediately when he came back because he asked his own wife because he was uh, very shocked at the encounter with the angel, by the way. When he came to his wife, he didn't tell her what happened right away. He just said, cover me up, cover me up. And they were saying, what's the matter? What happened? And finally, he, he tells her what happened. And she says, you've never told a lie in your life. Okay, why would he start now? at the age of 40, start to lie. And you've always tried to help bring the families together, to join people together, and he never broke any trust. He was known by a nickname given to him by the people of his time as what translates to English, the spirit of truth. He was called the spirit of truth, a sadiq. Yes or no? Alameen. The trustworthy, most trustworthy, and the one who is the mighty counselor of bringing families together. He was the one who comforted the families. And all these things he was called long before he was ever called to this prophethood by Allah. And by the way, I think uh, those who have studied the gospel know exactly where to find that in the gospel of John that he was called those things by Jesus, that he would come and he would be known as the spirit of truth, he would be the comforter, and it's called in Kone Greek, Parakletos. And if you look up Parakletos in the Kone Greek, there's a letter difference, but when you move that letter, you'll find that it says the praised one. Exactly. And what, how do you say praised one in Arabic? Ahmed. And that's what it says in chapter 61 of the Quran. It says that Jesus predicted the coming of Muhammad and his name would be Ahmed. Good points. You're getting up good stuff. What's the difference in the Quran or the Bible? The Quran still exists in its original format completely and is recited as it was revealed. The Bible is no longer recited that way in its original format. Or it used to be. I have books on the subject by Jewish scholars. There's a great one. It's easy to read in English by um, his professor, I believe, as well. It would be Richard Elliot Friedman. It's called Who Wrote the Bible? And you can learn a lot from him. He's talking only about the Old Testament, by the way. But it's very, very interesting, and, and it helped me a lot to understand better what happened to the original Bible. And who actually tried to bring it back was Uzair or Ezra. Next one, it said, why Muslims uh, something, Christians, Jesus, and vice versa. I, can't, I don't know what that word is. Why Muslims hate Christians and Jews and vice versa. Okay, do the Christians in here all hate Muslims? I don't think so. You wouldn't have come tonight. That'd be a dumb thing to do with the night, you know, let's go out and be with the people we hate. <laughs> so I don't think it's a valid statement in the question. I can't think the question's got a problem in it. Uh, do do uh, the Muslims here hate all the Christians? No. Do you hate all the Jews? No. There's a couple you're upset with, but... <laughs> but be honest. What, now, here's, I'm, I'm dumb. I'll admit it. I'm dumb. I thought I knew stuff. When I got to Islam, I found out how much I didn't know about anything. I know I didn't know any geography. And I didn't know any world po uh, political history whatsoever. And when I went to these countries and sat there and listened, I went, how did I miss all of this? But for sure, one of my big educations came in New York City 
I'm a delegate to the United Nations World Peace Summit for Religious Leaders, and when I was there with the rabbis, they sat there and educated me real quick to something I had no clue about. The rabbis in New York told me on no uncertain terms that what is going on now in Palestine is not in accordance with the teaching of their book. And they hate what's happening to the Muslims there, the Arabs there, and they said it is oppression and it's wrong. That's what they said to me. They made that crystal clear. And they said, we hope that you don't think that about us. And I said, I don't have an opinion on anything. You know, you guys are enlightening me to things I didn't know. They started to bring the proof and evidences from their books and they're saying this is wrong. It's wrong to go in and do these things. This is not the time. This is not the way. This is not the place. This is inappropriate. They use those words themselves. Now, on the other side of the coin, I have met Muslims who in Arab countries were saying some very horrible things against the Jews and Americans, but not Christians. They didn't say Christians. They said against all the Americans. Because they see America as being a, a dominant world power that's trying to control everything. They don't realize that we're just trying to, you know, help them. <laughs> like we helped the Indians in the United States. Like people helped the Maori, you know, when the British came over and helped folks, they just helped them. Help get some control over those wild birds that were going everywhere and all those big trees. Just bring over a few, what is it, dogs and some cats and some rabbits and the next thing you know, goodbye landscape. Yeah, help you. Don't help me, boy. Yeah. Good questions, though. You guys are, you guys are sharp. Do you think that fundamentalism in Islam is a response and a mechanism to modernity? Okay, first of all, fundamentalism is something that's used with reference to Christianity, not Islam. It's very inappropriate to use English words referring to the, to the Christian religion and try to bring that over to Islam because it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Just like talking about uh, revivalism in Islam or something like that. It doesn't work. You have to understand the word Islam is ongoing. It always means the same thing. Submit to God. How could you say, well, that's a fundamental submission to God, whereas this is a non-fundamental submission to God. And what about a secular submission to God? And what about... You're going, what are you talking about? You either submit to God or you don't. Islam doesn't have... This, um, yeah, this concept of secularism within it. You, if you believe in God and you're trying to do what he wants you to do, that's it. There you are. And you can still be an American and be a Muslim. This is, it's possible. And you can still be a Muslim and live here. You can be a Muslim and live any place. It doesn't change your political view. You don't become a, a Democrat or a Republican or something like, like that. that. It doesn't make sense. And when people use those kind of terms, maybe they're translating something from Arabic to say this. Maybe they're just trying to put another concept on your head. But what people are doing that's fanatical, if you want to talk about that, these are fanatical actions. It's not fanatical Islam. What would really, the most fanatical Islamist that there could be would be a Sufi. If you stop and think about it. That's all it could be, a real fanatical Muslim would have to be a Sufi who just sits there, you know, in a corner somewhere just worshiping Allah all day long and doesn't uh, eat and he doesn't sleep and he just keeps praying and praying and sitting in a corner. I don't think anybody's afraid of that guy. That would be an extremist. But what's happened is that there are people who are doing bad things and you're trying to give a label to it and incorporate Islam with it. Like saying a good Christian extremist that blows up people. What? Well, you got, it doesn't, how do you do that? That doesn't work. So some of the terms that people are using uh, negate the statement. And as far as modern entity, Islam is more modern than, than any other way of life because it always allows and encourages and exhorts even the Muslims to look to their surroundings, to their circumstances, to the nature, and use it to the best way. That's the commandment of Allah. 
most of us in the West, we're ignorant to the fact that most of the science we have today, the way that we understand it and the way that we use it, came from Muslim scholars. There will be those who immediately will say, no way, I don't want to believe that. No. Yeah, okay, that's, that's cool. But it doesn't change a fact. What we know in medicine today, if you really want to study it, go back and look, you'll find it comes from a very important book that was written by the Muslim scholars in Muslim Spain about six, seven hundred years ago. It's not a joke, that's a fact. Operations even on the brain were done back then. There are many, many uh, disciplines that we find that we're using today that you can go back and look. What's the problem is the Muslims themselves have lost touch with this and don't realize their own legacy. And unfortunately, that cripples the rest of us from being able to continue it. But just to give you one example before I leave the subject. At the time when Europe was considered to be in the Dark Ages, during the time of the Black Plague, that was a horrible time for Europe. At that exact same time as when Spain was in its heyday. And they used to send their students, the children from Europe, to go to Spain to learn from the big universities there. And when the children came back, by the way, side note, when they came, even if they had the diseases, it never spread amongst the Muslims, ever. It was almost like magic and it made the Muslims investigate to find out what was causing this. And this is when hygiene became clear in the European countries to understand what hygiene was and how important it was because the reason for this spread of these plagues was because there was no hygiene amongst those European people. But the Muslims always had it. They wash five times a day minimum to do their prayers. And another rule in Islam is if there is a plague, you're not allowed to leave nor enter the area. That was 1400 years ago that was stated. So as soon as the people carried this teaching back to Europe, the thing ended. If you doubt what I said, just go check it out. The other thing is when they came back home, the parents were real proud of the fact that they could say Arabic words. Like, wallahi. <laughs> it asks the question about Shiites and Sunnis, the difference of conflicts, etc., different groups. And also the question, I read in books that Muhammad was a man of war and concern, uh, conquered lands and ordered assassination. Is that true? And do you have a response to this? First of all, there are many different groups of people calling themselves Muslims. Is that true? Yeah. And each one that has a label on it, especially if they insist on that label, is running the risk of going to hell. That's what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said 1400 years ago. He said, as the Jews and Christians divide up into 71 or 72 groups, meaning in an Arabic idiom, it just means as one group divides up, another divides even more, and the Muslims will divide even more than that. And he used the word 73. And he's saying here, no matter how much they divide, Muslims will always divide more, and all of them will be in hellfire, except for the ones who are on the original Quran and the teachings of Muhammad. That's what he said. So for the benefit of those who adhere to their group names, regardless of what it might be, you're running that risk because sometime your ideology will be accepted off of what one man said, regardless of how saintly you think he was, you're taking what a man said as opposed to what God said. And that is a very serious problem. So again, the, the writer here the, asking me has nailed a very important note to the wall for you and don't divide up because that division is your destruction here in this life and in the next life as well the last one that he had reference to about Muhammad was a man of war and he conquered lands and he ordered assassinations is that true or false it's true he engaged in war yes or no yes and they conquered lands yes he ordered people to be assassinated sure did would you like to know the circumstances or you just want to take that and run with it? Huh? Because you can take things and say them. You can say them about people. You can even go to the Bible and say things about Jesus in a way that, that I won't accept for you to say it. As a Muslim, I would not accept for you to say it. But it's by the way that you present a question. 
they engaged in war. It's well known. The battles are well documented exactly how they came about. But it's also known that the Muslims were forbidden to ever engage in any war until the order came from Allah and then it had these certain conditions. It had these rulings that came with it, limitations, that even in the Geneva Convention, you don't find something as amazing as what is said in the Quran itself. Now, probably you don't want to hear that part, so if you want to run away before I give you the answer, go ahead. Because it's very clear that for 13 years, the Muslims suffered atrocities at the hands of their persecutors in Mecca. Their own families, their own people hated the fact that the Muslims were worshipping one God. That was the bone of contention. Anything else they could have accepted. They even said it. If you'll just worship our God for one year, you know, we'll give you anything you want. And they offered Muhammad many things. You want women? We'll give you women. And he said no. So for the benefit of those who said, oh, he's a womanizer, well then why didn't he accept that? And they offered him wealth. And he didn't accept that. And they offered him a high position. He could be a ruler, a governor for them. And he refused that. He said, we'll never stop worshiping God without partners. And that was what made those pagans upset. Because they wanted to have the multiplicity of deity. That was what the real bone of contention was about. And then, they began torturing the Muslims. They even killed them. The first martyr for Islam was a woman. And she was killed in the most horrible way that doesn't even need to be described here tonight. You can't believe what they did to this poor woman. Then her husband, and they did it in front of their son. And the son was also tortured. And what was it about? Because they stopped torturing as soon as he said, Okay, I'll worship your gods. Or okay, I'll accept that. Or I'll say that mom is not a prophet. Or whatever it was. As soon as he did that, they let him go. And he's the one who told the story. So that was the only bone of contention. They put sanctions against the Muslims and drove them off their own property, out of their own houses, out of their own land. They stole their properties. They killed them, abused them, raped the women, and put them out in the desert to die. And they lived out there for two years. Still, they had no order from Allah to go back and fight. And they didn't. Finally, a group of people came from a place called Yathrib and offered them sanctions there said come to us and it'll be a place that you can come and you'll be all right and we'll protect you and they went it became renamed as medina which means city and that's where muhammad peace be upon him and his companions retired to that area and the people there became helpers to them they're called ansar which means helpers and then while they were in medina they wanted to make hajj which is the pilgrimage and they went back home to do it because you have to go to mecca to do it and, the, and how do you go to Hajj? Do you go with swords to Hajj? Do you go riding in on your horses? They didn't even have any horses, but you don't go riding in a, on, on your uh, big mounts and come in here with the, your regalia and all that. Because then when you go for Hajj, you're only wearing two towels. Is that true or false? Two towels. Can you imagine a guy wearing two towels and he walks three or four hundred miles? And when he gets there, and there were uh, maybe a couple thousand of them, uh, I don't know the exact number now, but they were turned away by those same people again. And they said, all we want to do is just go in front of the Kaaba and just go around it and do the ceremonies that Abraham used to do. We just want to do that. And they said no and, and drove them back. They said, come back next year. And when they went back next year, the people didn't uphold their agreement. And again, they were turned back. And there's details about this. This is well chronicled, the details of what happened in those events. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, we've got to go back. They even signed an agreement with the people that if you just let us come next year. And they said, okay, here's the agreement. We want, we want that give us any of the people that you have that are captives. Okay, take them. Plus, we want to keep all of the captives we have from you. Yes or no? Yeah, and they did. In even a lopsided deal like that, and they signed it, agreed to it, and they came back, they still didn't honor and wouldn't let them come and do the Hajj. And then finally, you find the verses in the Quran, and let's read it in the correct order. Chapter 2, verse 107, uh, 189. I'm going to start there instead of where most people go in verse 191. Because it said, Yasalunaka. They're asking you, Muhammad, 
وسلم, about the moons and tell them the, the sighting of these moons is so they know how to do the Hajj because it's referring to Hajj. And it's, by the way, every time this same subject comes up about combat, you'll see it always has to do with Hajj right before that. Go check uh, verse 36 in chapter 9, Sir Talba, you'll find the same condition again. Read it, and it talks about Hajj, and talks about that because of what happened. This is a specific incident. It tells you clearly. And it says, uh, then it goes on to the subject about after this, is about entering their doors of the house by going in the back door, is that better? Because they had a superstition about it. And again, the answer is no. Go in the houses by proper doors. Piety, piousness, righteousness with the law is not about how you enter your houses, but it's what's in your heart. Then the next question that people had asked about is when are we going to get to fight for our rights? This was implied by the answer that comes that tells them that they can, now they can fight. And it tells them the word in Arabic for combat is kital. And it was used like that, kital. And it says that they can engage in it and fight them where they fight you and turn them out from where they turned you out. And it's very clear that it's talking about the, their own place that they've been driven out of and by whom is these pagan idolaters. And it tells you if they stop, you have to stop. Then it goes on, it says, and kill them if they're killing you. That this killing is better than the terrorism that these people are spreading. So this is very relative to today's situation. We see that Islam is the enemy to terrorism. And then it continues again and it says, but if they stop, you have to stop, otherwise you become the transgressor, and verily Allah does not love the transgressors. So it makes it clear. It makes it very clear that the rules that were set forth for war in Islam predated the Geneva Convention by 1400 years is still better. Because Muslims in a real war with real Muslims, I'm not talking about some wild band of thieves that steal a car and go out here and hold up a place. We're not talking about that's Forget that stuff. But it's very clear that when there is this war, like Muhammad peace be upon him and his followers engaged in, it was not to convert people because it's very clear in the Quran that they cannot convert people. It's very clear. But it is so that people have the right to have their religion. The many wars, and a lot of people don't know this, but Muslims also fought so that Christians and Jews could have their right to worship. And that's also again in Muslim Spain. Go back and read about it. It was the Muslims who defended them. But, you know, and it may be something to do with the monotheism. I can't answer that. I don't know why God has it, the, the things the way he does. But certainly there's always been the opportunity for Jews and Christians to live together in peace and harmony because Allah says that he does not forbid you to live in peace and harmony with these people that are not driving you out of your land and not killing you. But even when you have captives, you're not allowed to torture them. You're not allowed to uh, uh, do the things that we see as being done every day. You can't hold people and not give them the opportunity of any kind of defense. You're not allowed to do that in Islam. It's very clear. So these things that we're seeing that are happening today on both sides don't represent Islam. They don't represent Christianity either. But it's not right for the Muslims today to accuse all Christians of being guilty about what some people did, nor is it right the other way around. It makes sense? But read stuff in its entirety, don't read part of something. Now, as far as the part of conquering lands, the lands were turned over to the Muslim state by the new people themselves, because when Islam spread, the people accepted Islam. I'll give you the best example is Egypt. When the Egyptians accepted Islam, there was, there was no big fighting going on or anything like that. The Egyptians accepted Islam because they liked it. Most of them were Christian. They accepted Islam, tore down their churches and rebuilt, facing the direction of, of the Kaaba in Mecca, using the same materials. And the proof, I've seen it, I've been in there and seen those ancient materials are still standing. And if you go to Al-Azhar University, 
the women's section of the mosque there has these huge pillars and up at the top it still has the cross on them. They had rubbed it out, but you can still see the very vague uh, shape of it on there. And also at Masjid Amr ibn al-As, which is there in Egypt, in one section that they were doing some construction on, they even showed me and pointed to it and I used our cameras to photograph it. But they said the Christians of the time wanted to rebuild their churches as mosques. And they did. So that's what really happened. So yes, they conquered it. You would say that's conquering, but you <laughs> that's not going in and chopping people's heads off if they don't say accept Islam. Never once did that such a thing happen, ever. Read the real history of Islam and you see that never did happen. Not one time did they ever say, either accept that there's only one God, I'm going to cut your head off. However, I encourage you to go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, World Book Encyclopedia, go to Encyclopedia Americana, any of them, and look up the word Crusades and see what happened. Then look up the word Inquisition and see what happened. During the Spanish Inquisition, that's exactly what they said. Either say God is three or they tortured the people to death. Yes or no? Even the Vatican admits that. I traveled halfway around the world to be with you. And a lot of people spent a lot of their own hard-earned money and time to put this program together. And only Allah knows how much sacrificing and how much work it took to be able to get this, this event to take place. And a lot of you sacrificed your time to come and be with us tonight. And I just want to express my appreciation to Almighty God for giving me the opportunity to address you. I hope what I said didn't misguide anybody or hurt anybody. It was my sincere desire from the time that I left my home to come here to do nothing more than to share Islam. And yeah, I'm heading toward a commercial again, you're right. But I really hope that there was benefit here tonight. And if there was any good here tonight whatsoever, I'll give all the credit to Allah. And I'll accept responsibility for my own mistakes. Ask Allah to forgive me and let me do better next time. The subject we've been talking about tonight is a very big one. And in one meeting like this, you really can't get very far. Not really. But at least we touched some of the topics. And we hope that it will open up dialogue in the future. We hope that the Muslims here in your community will pick up where I left off. And we hope that they will share this message more with their families and then with their neighbors as well. That's my sincere desire. And I'll close with just a little prayer like I did before and just ask Allah to guide us. Guide us to truth and open our hearts and remove the biasness remove the racism, remove the hatred, and replace it with true love for mankind, true love for God, and let Allah decide in the final analysis. Sami. Till next time. Peace. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah.